No matter if points are gained or points are lost, there will be much to discuss. For analysis regarding tonight's Winnipeg Jets game, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mandel. The Illegal Curve post-game show starts now. Good evening, Winnipeg. Good evening, Manitoba. For all those joining us live this evening on our YouTube channel and all of our social media platforms, we say good evening, universe, and welcome to the Illegal Curve post-game show. Sometimes it's nice to go where everyone knows your name and everyone knows the name of Dave Manouk on the right of the screen. And I'm your host, Drew Mandel, here to talk about tonight's Winnipeg Jets defeat at the hands of the juggernaut. Boston Bruins, the Jets with the early 2-0 lead, but as legendary baseball manager Frank Robinson once said, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. The Boston Bruins staging a furious comeback and take the victory in regulation time by a 3-2 margin. Dave M., good to see you on this Thursday evening. Both of us playing a little bit under the weather, but we'll power through for the good folks who join us here each and every time we do a post-game show after a Jets game. This one uh, was a battle. It was billed as a sort of a battle of, of two of the top teams in their respective conference. The Bruins, who, of course, have just been absolutely unbelievable this season. as They have been for so many years in a row. And the Jets, who are sort of the, the upstart team that have surprised so many people this year. And the Jets got off to a good start, but weren't able to maintain it through the entirety of the 60 minute of tonight's contest. Yeah, I mean, look, you don't become 17-0 and 2 at home, now 18-0 and 2 at home by accident. That's not a that's not a mirage, that's not a team that it's very I would say it's a little unusual that they've played so many more games at home than they have on the road and their road winning mm-hmm. percentage is around 66% and their home winning percentage is about 90 one percent i think and of course obviously they have two regulation uh, overtime losses or shootout loss i don't know which ones they are but the reality is like it's their their numbers are insane they really are <laughs> and um what boston has been able to do is uh build themselves i mean first of all swayman was excellent i mean he was he made some very nice saves on the jets when he needed to um when the jets looked like they could really open things up in that first period mm-hmm. and it was a fairly mm-hmm. even first and and it was a it was a good effort, and you thought to yourself, okay, well, that's regardless of the score at that point, you're just thinking, well, the Jets can hold their own with Boston, and of course, that's why we always say, as cliche as it is, hockey is a 60 minute game, and it requires a 60 minute effort because things are not decided after 20 or after 40, not necessarily even after 60. But the reality mm-hmm. was that uh, the Jets were going up against, quite honestly, the best team in the NHL, and for the first time this season, and Boston was full value. I mean, they've got the best power play in the league. They've got a top five penalty kill in the league. And again, the energy in that building was incredible. I mean, the fans are into it. And, you know, look, the there's definitely, I think, Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg fin, Winnipeg Free Press, who must be down there for the free, he yeah. said, you know, nothing sucked the energy out when, like, when the Jets got the second goal from Jansen Harkins. But at the same time, it was still a great atmosphere in that building. And we know we've, we've been to Boston, Drew, and we know what it's like to uh, – Boston sports, it's 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 really next level, actually. There's not much like it. I mean, of course, New York sports, similar. But any of those East Coast cities, Philly sports, that's sort of the same sort of thing. That's a passionate fan base. So, yeah, I mean, look, it was it was an interesting game from a Jets team that, and you, look, we talked, I talked in the chat for most of the game, second, third periods, for a little bit of the first with some of the folks here. And we talked about some of the, the power plays, opportunities that were given or not given seemed a little bit uh, interesting. And I thought, especially the worst one by far, if you're going to call anything, was that non-high-sticking call against Pierre-Luc Dubois. And, and look, we're not going to say that the special teams was the difference, but, you know, the Pr- Bruins did score a special teams goal, right? So, I mean, that is a, a benefit to them. And and they had more, what did they end up with? Four power plays, five power plays in the game. So, I mean, it, it definitely was a factor to the two that the Jets had. Yeah, but five. Yeah, and so it, it is. It is a, I, again, like I said, I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and say the Jets were the better team, and you know, blah blah blah, because they weren't. But power plays do give your team momentum, and I think that the Bruins were able to generate, even though the Jets PK actually looked pretty good, and Jets PK is a top five PK as well. But it was one of those situations where you're sitting there thinking to yourself, okay, uh, you're you. Th- you know, we we tend to think of of game management from the refs, and they're gonna unless it's egregious, unless it's like a two hander. You know, unless it's the Taylor Hall kind of cross check from behind on Billy Hainola, 
you kind of tend to think that the refs do say, okay, well, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, but it didn't seem that way. And, and, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't really believe in that kind of nonsense, but I just thought that it was, it was a little telling that some of the penalties that were marginal, like the Mark Shifley penalty, which ultimately got a goal against for the, for the, for against the jets was a pretty marginal call. And, and I didn't think it was one that, you know, I agreed with Kevin Sawyer, what he said on the broadcast, like, that's the kind of thing that you just let the game go. It's too much. If the rep, really, you put their whistles away. Unless it's, unless, like I said, unless it's that cross check from behind, unless it's a clear Kevin Stanley loose, you have to have control of your stick. He smashes uh, the Bruins guy in the face. That's a high sticking penalty. You know, that those are the pretty clear. But like the Mark Shively one, you let it go and look what it does. It changes the, 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 the sort of composition of that hockey game and it gives the, uh, the Bruins some life. And so, unfortunately for the Winnipeg Jets, the special teams was a little bit weighted in one way versus the other. But Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, you have to be able to, you know, hold your own five on five. And it was the Bruins five on five who were uh, really controlling the play, especially in the second and third periods. Yeah. You know, uh, the Bruins are, you know, the, the, they, they are notorious for getting sort of uh, champions calls, let's call them, uh, you know, where they get the benefit of the doubt from the officials. Uh, and I don't know if that's a function of just them at, at being at such a high level for so many years or them just sort of knowing how to uh, work the system to their advantage. I, look, I don't think that the officiating was the difference in this game. There were certainly, it had an impact on it, which you never really want officiating to have an impact on. But the final 40 minutes of this game, the Bruins were really taking it consistently to the Winnipeg Jets. And sure, uh, the Bruins have to, you know, you'll, they, whether or not they, they say so in their, in their post game media availability, they got a very lucky bounce, which changed the tenor of the game. I mean, getting that bounce on, on their first goal, and we'll get into it in the Betway game recap here on the Illegal Curve post game show brought to you by Betway. It changes everything that's going on in the game. Sure, they're coming at the Jets, and sure that they've been sort of controlling the flow of the play after what I would describe as a relatively even, if not even leaning a bit in the Jets' favor first period. But Connor Hellebuck, to that point in time, has really been standing on his head. There's no guarantee he's going to continue to stand on his head and continue to play lights out and continue to make you know breakaway saves on, on David Pasternak like he did early in in that first period. But you know the the longer the Bruins go with being snake bit, probably the more confidence Hellbuck gets, the more frustration the Bruins maybe get. Although given a veteran team like the Bruins, I don't think they would have gotten that frustrated. They would have realized they just bide their time. But they get that very fortuitous bounce, and it ends up in the back of the Jets' net. And you could just sort of see that there was almost, if you wanted to take tonight's game and say there was almost two halves to the game, that is where you sort of get the peak, and then everything else is going down the hill from the Winnipeg Jets' perspective because they just didn't have, I thought, an answer to that lucky break by the Bruins. And they got close at the end of the game, and you know, more often than not, Kyle Connor in that situation, right. don't ask me how he gets that open with four seconds to go in the game. How does Kyle Connor get behind your defense when you've pulled the goalie or when the opposition has pulled the goalie with four seconds to go in the game? More often than that, uh, he he scores that goal and then it's maybe three all and it goes to overtime and it's a whole different conversation we're having tonight on the illegal curve post game show. But, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Bruins are perennial contenders, perennial champions. Mm-hmm. And you saw it almost in, in some of their play in the second and the third period tonight, they get the hometown bounce. They get the home cooking when it comes to some of the officials decisions, you get some just that they just have that aura around them of being a, a, a tremendous team. I wouldn't say tremendous franchise because it's almost like the players succeed in spite of the front office and some of the decision making and some of the uh, poor drafting. I mean, uh, of course, Kyle Connor being in that position because Kyle Connor, you know, probably should have been a member of the Bruins if they, I don't know, Lord knows what the hell they were doing on that draft year. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it just goes to show you that Patrice Bergeron, David Pasternak, you know, Brad Marchand, 
whatever you think of him. Um, you know, Charlie McAvoy, some of those other guys in that Boston. Jake DeBrusque was one of those guys taken in 2015 for the record. Sure. Jake DeBrusque. I mean, he's been there for long. Although enough. imagine, he's... imagine for the record, had they taken instead of the other two guys, I yes. their names are Jacob Zaporal and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jake DeBrusque I, and somebody I, I, else. I, 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 I mentioned it was. in the chat today, but it's amazing. The next two players, 17 and 18, Matthew yeah. Barzell, yeah. Kyle Connor. Could you imagine the Bruins? With those three players on the team, Oof. it's probably in a slightly better position, but which is hard to believe because they're in such a great position usually. In any yeah. event, the Jets uh, aren't able to uh, get that equalizing goal. They're not able to hold the lead. You sort of saw the Jets again. I thought that they, similar to to Sunday in Seattle, they ran out of steam a little bit, and especially with a team like Boston, which is just going to when they smell blood, they know mm -hmm. how to take advantage of it. And the Jets had a you know, a decent push in the last few minutes of the third period. And they had that opportunity within that empty, but you could see, I thought from that, from the time of the, the stanchion goal, it was, it was all Boston from my perspective at that point. The big, the big debate drew that yeah. I was having in the chat. I won't name names turd, but I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not going to name names, but the big debate that, that we were, that might be too obvious. T erd. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Fine. T Ferguson. But anyways, yeah. the point I was trying to, what we were chatting about, yeah. is uh, whether you would have used a timeout after the first kind of wonky Bruins goal, but not because of the goal, because that's whatever. But right after that, the Bruins had a lot of momentum. They threw a lot at Connor Hellebuck and the Winnipeg Jets. So do, yeah. you, do you use your timeout there or do not you hold it in advance? And for the record, don't use it at all for the rest yeah. of the game. So, well, you know, I mean, the, the truth is, I think the Jets almost would have been, would have preferred a whistle in the last two minutes after they pulled Connor Hellebuck because it was a little bit of, uh, they were having some trouble getting set up in, in oh, the it was chaotic. zone. chaotic. It was terrible. Yeah, and it's just a function of, I thought the players were gassed and uh, the Bruins did a great job of sort of stuffing up the neutral zone. And as they just couldn't get a, they couldn't get a whistle because of the just constant flow uh, to the game. And that's to Boston's advantage or, Look, I understand the, the, the question. I wouldn't have used the time out there. I thought that the, you know, I, I don't think it's going to help that dramatically. This isn't mm -hmm. like you're playing against uh, a team, you know, that, that sort of relies on momentum. They're the Boston Bruins. They're going to be able to come at you regardless of if you have five yep. timeouts and you take them in a row. For sure. Um, you know, to me, that, to me, that wouldn't have, that's not a big, uh, that, that wouldn't happy, have been I would have Turns expected happy. there. Turd's happy. Yeah, Turd's well, I agree happy. with Turd in this one. I mean, I, I don't think a timeout there is going to do much. Boston's not going to change their philosophy because you take a 60-second timeout. They're the Bruins. They know actually, how to... If, especially considering it's only a 30-second timeout. Well, there you go. Even, <laughs> that's right. I was giving them an extra one at that point. Right. Like, were they taking back-to-back -back uh, yeah, timeouts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just didn't... Uh, I don't think that's going to make a difference. Okay. The, the, the Boston Bruins today, the Jets played a very good first period. And then they learned that this is what, in the second and the third period, this is what a Stanley Cup, you know, perennial Stanley Cup contender looks like. And the Jets are a damn good team in the Western Conference. Mm -hmm. But to me, the two best teams that the Jets have played this year are the Carolina Hurricanes. I mean, and and, and that's on, and then that was on an off game uh for the hurricanes and they still managed to score those three goals and send it to overtime carolina and boston to me are the two best teams that the jets have faced this year the two teams that uh by and large had the jets on their heels the most i know there mm -hmm. were some bad games against western conference opponents don't get me wrong yeah but i you know i i thought the jets can compete against vegas um you know the jets can obviously compete against the dallas stars uh, they can compete against most of the teams in the Western Conference. The game against Boston and the game against Carolina are the two games where I thought the Jets were just sort of on their heels for the most part and couldn't match their opponents' uh, skill set, speed, things of that nature. And there's other games, but like, you know, uh, the, the game against Seattle when they were on their heels last Sunday, but that to me is more uh, rest factor. It's more of a. It's more of a uh, fatigue factor. Boston, Carolina, to me, are, are two of the best teams that we that we've seen out of the East, uh, and, and completely. Yeah, and I, the only thing I would add is that, you know, and I think I don't remember who made the comment, but I liked it. It was it was I can't give out the tough duck uh, too for the hardest hitting comment because that's Drew's purview, not mine. You can do it if you see something no, that you want no, to give it out. I'm to, not, but I mean, I'm I'm going to agree that I like the idea of you know seeing Boston and the Jets play a big series. Now, of course, 
worth noting, Boston's healthy, right? The Boston Bruins are a healthy hockey team right now, as far as I mm-hmm. know. I don't think that they're missing any of their big, big, big guns. The Jets are. Jets are missing some big players. Yeah. And again, we're not here to make excuses for a team that lost the game. Boston was a better team. But I just think that if uh, I'd love to see a healthy Winnipeg Jets club against a healthy no Bruins team and then see those two teams duke it out. Because I just think that I'm not suggesting that the Jets would have it would have changed the end result. I just think it would have most likely mitigated some of the um, unevenness in the second and third periods. I think the Jets might have had a little more push with some of their bigger dogs, a guy, a guy like Nikolai Ehlers, a guy no, like no, you know, no Blake Wheeler. Just add a few more of those guys into the lineup. And I think you get a little bit more, but no, I mean, look, it's a, it's a, it's a good lesson for the jets to learn. I mean, you have to go up against a team like Boston and one mistake, one, one small breakdown, leaving mm-hmm. Nick Foligno wide open in front uh, mm-hmm. of Connor Hellebuck. That's the difference in the hockey game. Cause the stanchion goal is like, whatever a power play goal, not a big deal, but the five on five goal in the third period with what eight minutes, eight forty to go in the third, that drew is where you, you have to be, you know, let's just true to, to steal a Drewism. Thank your you attention to detail matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and right then and there, I, I think it was Brendan Dillon and uh, was it Morgan Barron? I, I think there were a number, number of guys who abandoned their post and Nick Foligno is wide open in front and, and it ends up in the back of the net. So it, it was Kyle Connor. Connor was the, uh, Kyle Connor, Connor was, was one of the guys too. Yeah. Connor and yeah. Dubois, I think were the, were the two uh, uh, guilty parties there. You could sort of look at them. They were, they were almost, they were, they, I think they were confused as to who got who and then not, nobody got, uh, and then nobody got Felino and it ended up in the back of the net. I mean, look, there's, look at the face off percentage in this game. And this is something Ooh. that I think the Jets, the Jets need I, to get better at that. They, in fact, yeah. Drew, just to, just to quickly interject before you get to the raw numbers, mm-hmm. I was thinking about it throughout the course of this broadcast and for a while. What the Jets need to do instead of going on holidays, they need to have a clinic on, remember when Paul Maurice brought in, uh, who was it? Was he, was it the ref? And they, they worked on face offs for, for, like yeah, a couple like of practices training camp or something. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. And they did just face-offs. This team needs to work on their face-offs. Well, I mean, so it was, I mean, and, and again, it's hard, to, you know, it's, when you, when you don't get possession on two thirds of the face-offs, cause I'm pretty sure it was about 67% winning percentage for the Bruins and most NHL games, you know, it's not necessarily exactly 50, 50, but it's within realm of 50, 50, 60, 40, 67, 33, is is one-sided beyond belief which is why i mean not that we're getting ahead of ourselves but looking towards the trade deadline if a guy like ryan o'reilly would come available i think that would be a huge addition for the jets because again it it would help up the middle it would help in the face-off circle everything that's a digression for another day in time but you know when you when you're starting without the puck on two-thirds of all face-offs you're 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 swimming upstream you know, you're starting each shift by swimming upstream a little bit. And that's an area of concern. And I'm sure that it's something that, uh, you know, Rick bonus and and the coaching staff are going to try and work on. And it's something the jets should be better at, at this point in time, you know, and I know the Bruins have Patrice Bergeron and Patrice Bergeron is basically the perfect hockey player. I mean, that's what you're talking about. Basically with Patrice Bergeron, he's Patrice Bergeron or Brad Marchand. No, the reason I'm saying that is because there was a graphic showing uh, Bruins who had, I think it was like 100 points or something like that. And they, it was a picture. I think they were talking about, it was either Patrice Bergeron. Yeah. Or they showed it, but the, the name bar the name bar said Brad Marchand. I got Marchand. you. I got you. But, I mean, Having a little look, they, fun at TSN's expense. No big you deal. Do, you do enjoy doing that, I got to say. Uh, you, yeah. you know, uh, look, there's so much to like about the Boston Bruins and so much that you want to model your, again, the way they play. And, yeah. you know, they get, do they get some calls? Yeah. There's no question. They get some calls. Do mm-hmm. they get the benefit of the doubt? Yeah. There's no question. They get the benefit of the doubt, but that's just, you know, the beauty of being the King. If you're the King or you're close to the being the King, you oftentimes get the iffy calls in your favor. And, uh, you know, you saw that at times in tonight's game, but in my books, also full marks to the Bruins for uh, a well-deserved victory. And the jets can use this as a, uh, as an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to get better. And again, these, you know, this is a, a good hockey team. The jets still are, but if you want to get to the Bruins level, this is what you need to do to get there. Well, Drew, and that's why the comment I put up was appropriate uh, mm-hmm. by flying and Dukes, because it, they said, it, it, if this is a measuring stick game, jets showed well in some ways and can really learn from it in others. I'm going to add that part, but, it, and it's true. I mean, there absolutely is, that is the case. And so, 
Um, the I, I didn't love the end of the game by the Winnipeg Jets when there wasn't that proper urgency. They seemed like a, just a tired group and they just didn't have their legs. And remember, this is a team that hasn't been practicing much. So oh God, they played seven. I mean, look, no, no, this been this December has been insane. I'm not, I'm not yeah. minimizing it because I'm just saying they haven't had to practice. So they've had that benefit of staying off the ice, but it's still been, I mean, Drew, what is this? The 16th game or something like that? Not really, but you know what I mean? Like there's been a lot of games through 22 game, days in December. Look, when, after tomorrow night, you know, when the season, when the, when the, the schedule, you know, finally the pre-Christmas schedule finally comes to an end tomorrow night, yeah. it will have been, uh, six games in eight days. I mean, that's what it'll, it'll be. It'll have been yeah. six games in eight days. And that two, is... and two and true, two on the West Coast, one at home, and yeah. then and then the two in the uh, in the right Eastern in the East them. Coast. I mean that 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 schedule malpractice. Yeah. And then they're talking about and and I mean, Ezzy and I talked about this in whatever show it was. I don't remember. Um, that scheduling malpractice. Mm-hmm. It's 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 unfair to the athletes. And the, yeah. then they're talking about adding two more games to make. Oh, I saw that. I, all I could think about was like, I'm like, no, reduce the games. Yes. Reduce, reduce the games. by just Adding games is the dumbest thing. Like I get it. You make more money. Yeah. It is the stupidest plan. The games are terrible. And you know what I was thinking, Drew? And I, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but mm-hmm. it, to me, why do I need to see every single team? You don't. Like you don't. It's kind of, to be honest with you, it's kind of like baseball in the sense that it was kind of a, it's kind of a treat to see certain teams infrequently because then when you actually get to see them, Look there the is NFL. a certain. Look at the yeah. NFL. If you're in the NFC North, you see the AFC teams at home once every eight years. Right. Once every eight years. And nobody goes, uh oh. yeah. you know, there's a way to schedule it where you know you can go every second year at home and, and seeing the Bruins, or every second year you see the Devils at home. I mean, you know, those are the games that for the you know, by and large, with the exception of you know you know, a couple teams with superstar players, Yeah, you know, that, that they don't sell that well. So from my perspective, there's a way to, you know, this idea that it has to balance perfectly, that you have to play four games against everyone yeah, in know. your division, three games against everybody in the other division in your conference, two games against the Eastern Conference for a grand total, because it works out perfectly to be 84. They need fewer games, not more games, fewer games. You see the quality of the play. Sometimes you six games in eight nights, coast to coast, is 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 unfair to the players. It leaves them more vulnerable to injuries, and this isn't a Winnipeg Jets specific complaint. This is just a comment about athletes in general. Six games in eight nights leaves them vulnerable to injury. It, it reduces the competitive integrity of the game when one team is sitting there twiddling their thumbs because another team, meanwhile, another team has been playing nonstop hockey basically for an entire week. It, 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 it's just, it, it needs to be reconsidered entirely as to how they come up with the schedule and, I mean, and, and how they come up with the right number of games. And I understand it's all about money. I'm not stupid. I know yeah. that. But it's insulting to everybody else that that they're to pretend they're, like it's like it's like adding more preseason games. Like, oh right. god, I really need to see seven preseason games. Yeah. Like, no, it's obviously. Well, and, they're, a, and they're trying to and they're trying to. You know, they'll say, well, as a result of these fewer, if we add two more regular season games, we'll only do four preseason games: two on the road and two at home. That'd be perfect. Uh, that'd be uh, you know what? if that was the case, I'd be I'd be full marks for that. Well, that's pre- they wouldn't they wouldn't do seven preseason games or whatever the number would be. It would be that would be crazy. I mean, I, I would never know, put I anything past the NHL, Drew. So true. just be, I say be they careful. They wouldn't, yeah. but you never know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, the point is that it's 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 an unusual situation for the Jets. But yeah. look, I mean, Rick Bo- Sean um, Reynolds of, of Sportsnet was asking uh, Rick Bonus about that about the idea of guys you know getting hurt basically because they're playing too much because of the schedule and these guys don't want to. You know, you know, they don't want to throw the NHL under the bus, but mm-hmm. it just it is an unusual situation for the NHL to not be aware. Well, actually, it isn't unusual. The NHL is often not aware. So <laughs> I guess we aware, should. But they don't care. They, yeah, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's yeah, what's I know. It about? it's about this, Drew. Let's get into it. The Betway game recap. It's brought to you by yeah. oh, it took us 25 minutes. Yeah, I know. It's usually how we do it on this post-game show. One of the most trusted voices in sports betting, both in Canada and all around the world. Betway is the sports betting app that puts you, the customer, at the forefront. 
with a large selection of betting options and sports, as well as strong promotions and fair odds. What are you waiting for? Head on over to Betway and bet your way. Must be 19 years or older to play. Please play responsibly. It was a great start to the game for the Winnipeg Jets. Mark Shifley, his 20th of the year, eight consecutive years. Mark Shifley has now scored 20 or more goals. Crazy numbers. We're old. Somehow Mark Shifley's been around for that long. I heard, I was listening in the car to Kelly Moore on the CJOB broadcast. Eight times this year, in 32 games, Mark Shifley has opened the scoring. That's a wild stat, in my opinion, that a quarter of all the games the Jets have played, Mark Shifley is responsible for the first goal. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I heard that on the, on the, like I said, on the CJLB broadcast. Anyways, Mark Shifley opens the scoring a minute 58 into the first period. Assists to Cole Perfetti and Carson Kuhlman. Uh, Kuhlman's first point as a member of the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah. Uh, newsflash to teams in the NHL. Don't leave Mark Shifley behind your defenseman that wide open because he's likely to do some damage. And he did here on a nice uh, play by Perfetti to knock the puck forward to the uh, uncovered Mark Shifley. Newsflash to me, don't pause, uh, pardon the interruption, and then be behind the play. So I'm watching, I, all of a sudden on Twitter, I'm like, wait, a goal? What the heck is going on? There's no goal here. Game hasn't even started. So I'd get caught up, Drew. But much like Mark Shifley, I mean, unlike me, Mark Shifley got started on time, and the Jets did as well with that first goal. And that's his 250th goal in the NHL, second most in that 2011 draft class behind uh, Nikita Kucherov in first. I think he has 260 or something like that. So he's not that far off. Mark Shifley, of course, has the most goals uh, for the Jets 2.0. He's now two ahead of Blake Wheeler, who has 248. Blake Wheeler has 258 total. I think he's, he scored 10 with Atlanta. But Mark Shifley just continues to do what you know is expected of him. We, we've come to just take for granted is produce. Although this year, unlike in years past, he is likely to eclipse 20 goals, likely to eclipse 30, likely to eclipse 40. He's he's flirting with 50, which is a big number for Mark Shifley. And and mm -hmm. you know one of the articles that I I read recently in in or I I posted in the in the morning papers was about the depth. I think it was um, it was a global. I don't know if Paulie Edmonds wrote it, but uh, or Kelly. But one one of the guys wrote it on CGOB, and and I think it was in yesterday's paper. It was talking about the depth of the centers and how the centers have all been producing. And Mark Shifley, and and you know, in years past, you would have like his, like last year, for example, you had Shifley would be going and Dubois would would not be going, or then Dubois would be going and Shifley wouldn't be going. This year, kind of, I, I I said it was kind of like a dog sledding team. They're all pulling in the same direction. You got Shifley, you got Dubois, and you've got Lowry. All three of those centers are producing and even Adam Lowry, right? I mean, he's, he's on pace to, you know, he's one point back of his, his total from last year. And he's, I think he's flirting with 50 points this year, which would be obviously a career high for him. So the Jets center depth has been uh, exceptional this year. And it's the reason why I think the record, in addition to Connor Hellebuck, of course, I think it's part of the reason why that their record is, is, is where it is. And yeah, Mark Shifley, you know, opens the scoring and, and, the team gets, you can see the Jets feel it because, you know, you come into this building, a team that hasn't lost once in regulation and you're feeling that pressure, right? The, the Jets know that the, the odds are against them, courtesy of our friends at Betway. The odds were significantly against the Winnipeg Jets coming into this game, mm -hmm. but you know, they, and they're feeling good. I mean, you know, regardless of the, of the outcome of the, of the last game, you know, cause it was a, it wasn't necessarily the most clean game, but you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, you're up against a team that nobody really thinks you can beat. It's a good test for you. And so the Jets get off to that good start, and that's what they needed to do. And they think, I think that was the first time the Bruins have been scored on in in some time So to, to open a game. So good for the Jets to get that start because that's exactly what they needed to kind of get feeling and get, get feeling good about their game. Yeah, and they certainly felt good at that point. That's what you want to do when you're playing against a, a you know a team like Boston, uh, you know, on the road where it's a difficult place. You want to get that early lead. You want to take the crowd out of it. And then the Jets really took the crowd out of it. Made it two nothing. Seven twenty mark of the first period. In case anyone was concerned, fear not. Josh Morrissey got a point. Uh, it was on Jansen Harkin's third goal of the season. Morrissey with his 33rd assist, which is still hard to believe. Adam Lowry also gets an assist. It's a great play down low. It's Lowry. It's Harkin's forechecking. It's mm -hmm. it's getting the puck below the goal line. 
working it back up to Morrissey. Morrissey with the shot from the point. And Jansen Harkins is causing trouble in front of Jeremy Swayman. He's, you know, being there and he's being big and he, you know, the puck sort of glances off of him, but it glances off of him enough to get through Swayman and give the Jets a 2 nothing lead. And that's how you're going to have to do it. It's going to have to be dirty. It's going to have to be greasy. And this is the definition of dirty and greasy uh, to make it 2 nothing for the Jets. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, that's exactly what we didn't see from the Jets later on in the game. Mm-hmm. And there was a uh, Brendan Dillon, I think, in the third period, you know, unleashed a howitzer from, from the point. And it was a nice shot. It was a heavy shot. But there's only one problem. Swayman saw it. There was nobody in front. There were no bodies in front. Nobody took away his eyes. So it's it's a lot easier for the goaltender to make that save. I don't care how hard Brendan Dillon's shot is. If you don't have bodies in front, it's very difficult. And that's what the Jets had to do. They couldn't get highlight tonight. You needed to go for that greasy goal type of thing. And that's exactly what happens, right? The Morrissey shot goes after, off Jansen Harkins. Shout out to Jansen Harkins. I mean, today was his 150th game in the NHL. The speaking of the 2000, it's that number already. 150, I know. really? And yeah, it is. And, and you know, it's impressive because if folks will remember, he was, he was the second rounder for the Jets in that remarkable mm-hmm. 2015 draft, the draft probably never to be repeated by the Winnipeg Jets, you know, or most other teams, because that almost every guy made an impact in the NHL. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, Harkins went down to the ECHL, right? We talk about it, went to the AHL, then went to the ECHL, came back up to the AHL worked his ass off, got to the NHL, went back to the AHL, and now is back in the NHL. In, it went, sorry, went back to the AHL, now back in the NHL. So um, you can see it. You can see even, you know, the, the play actually that for me that Jansen Har- that showed Jansen Harkin's work ethic, which is when I talk, I mean, nobody has work ethic to me like he does, was when he beat out the icing in the second period. There was a, you know, there was, a, it's a routine play, but you know what? You can see that the compete level is high with him right now. And, and that line, seems to be chugging along and and that was a nice play by Jansen Harkins and look he gets rewarded with his third goal of the season just being in the right spot which is in front of the net and Josh Morrissey 33 assists in 33 games I mean it's remarkable what he continues to do I mean 11 straight points uh you know with the um with an assist which I believe is uh the Thrashers Jets record so I mean he just continues to fire and all of a sudden the Jets are up to nothing and you're thinking to yourself is this going to be a blowout? The Bruins fans. Well, kind of, I, I, and again, anybody, I, I didn't think anybody think well, it was true. It was, it was, it was two, but it was two goals on four shots. Yeah. That's true so it's two goals on four shots. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, is the swimming not have it? Are the jets going to get lucky in the sense that, you know, he's, he's not feeling it because that's not a very good save percentage. Uh, after, after four shots and having, Hang giving on, up yeah, two goals. 50%. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with Kenny's water bottle, by the way, Harkins does have Dave Manuk level of work ethic. And maybe that's why I, I find him to be a kindred spirit. But anyways, the point say, is, is, is that why he was back in the minors? Ouch. <laughs> ouch. No, that's because he was just trying to talk. He wanted to talk to me more, Drew. He was like, I, I don't want to talk to all these no. NHL guys only. Dave's NHL and AHL. So I'll talk to him. There anyways. Anyways, exactly. Two nothing for the Jets after 20 minutes. I mean, Connor Hellbuck with a highlight reel save on David Pasternak after yeah. an, uh, an ugly interaction between uh, Dylan Sandberg. And I'm really not 100 percent sure. <laughs> Uh, what was going on there? Obviously, a poor miscommunication. Miscommun- Don't let Pasternak in uh, on a breakaway from uh, beyond from the red line. That's yeah. usually going to end poorly. It was even or maybe even from the from the opposing blue line. Even uh, don't let that happen typically. But uh, Hellbuck was up to the challenge there, made it two nothing uh, after twenty minutes, and it was still two nothing. You know, later into the third, into the second period, or into the second period, when Pasternak gets his twenty second of the year and assist to Nick Felino and and Grizzlechick. Uh, which I always mispronounce his name, so I'm just going to forgive me on that one uh, for going forward. Uh, and this is the one that just, it, it's just a killer. I mean, it's just a bad bounce off the, off the glass, off the boards, Hellbuck's out of the net, getting ready to try and knock it down, trying to knock down the rim in, uh, and it just comes right back out front to, to Pasternak, and Hellbuck does everything in his power to to try and get back into the net. But, I mean, David Pasternak's not going to miss that. And it's just teed up on a platter for him. And, again, you know, you'd say, you know, and I understand, like, you know, good teams get breaks like that. And they do. 
It just seems as though that's the case, that good teams always get the benefits of those bounces. And yeah, every arena doesn't isn't exactly uniform, but every baseball stadium isn't uniform either. And then there's sort of the unique charms of that uh, can be home cooking and can work to your advantage when you know the bounces. I'm not saying that the, you know, the Bruins did that on purpose or anything. It's just a bad bounce uh, that goes against the Winnipeg Jets here. And it, you know, ends up in the back of the net. And all of a sudden for a Bruins team that's been struggling to uh, get anything past Connor Hellebuck, yeah. uh, it's like manna from heaven uh, to make it a two, uh, to make it a two, one Jets lead rather than still two nothing on what looked to be a, a routine play. Yeah. And that, and that's definitely a little bit of a backbreaker because Connor Hellebuck looked legendary at that point. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, I mean, he went, spent two years at UMass Lowell in North Boston. So I suspect he probably uh, relished the idea of going, First of all, being you know challenged by such a good Bruins team, but also you know for having spent time there, the opportunity to play in TD Garden probably meant a lot to him after dealing with the illness that kept him out of the last game for the Winnipeg Jets. Right. But I mean, you can't. I mean, there it seems to be. I don't know why. There's a bit of a debate here as to whether he should have left his net or not. But I mean, every goaltender leaves his net to well, retrieve they used that to puck. Not. I, rem- I remember back in the day, years ago, I was at a, I was at a practice and you know, yeah. how rarely I go to practice. So I, I don't know. Practice. If I, maybe I didn't even have kids at this point in time. I probably didn't. That would be the only logical way that I, w- I was at a practice at that point. And I was, we were in the Matt Frost media center and we were, there was an, a- it was an afternoon practice and there was an afternoon game on, it must've been a Sunday or something. I don't remember. And I remember watching same thing, you know, puck sort of rimmed around on the glass, bad bounce. I want to say Philly. I can't remember exactly ended up in front of the net or maybe even went off bad bounce in the net and the goalie was behind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was talking to Dennis, Dennis Bayak about it. And Dennis is like, ah, goalie should puck was up on the glass. Goalie should have stayed in the net. And, you know, I think that used to sort of be the rule of thumb. Now it's less. So now it's, you know, if the goalie can go and knock down the puck, the goalie goes and knocks down the puck. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's more of a judgment call for the goalie than, than it used to be where if it's in the glass, stay in the net, so there's nothing like that. I mean, I'm not yeah. I'm not faulting Hellebuck. Well, I'm not faulting happens. anybody. It's just an absolutely uh, uh, an absolutely huge uh, uh, break for the Bruins. Yeah, I mean, look, I we I remember that it happened to Eric Comrie uh, once years ago. It was very weird. Like it, it it was even more bizarre than today's because it actually hit the stanchion and bounced into the net. Yeah, off of that bounce is because he went behind the net. So we were talking about Darren Quint uh, last week. Oh, yes. So remember, That's there true. you go. Darren that is Quint. true. Joaquin Gage is, 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 is the poster boy for staying which, in which, that. How weird was that, that we were talking about that? And then the next day. Uh, yeah, it was very weird. It was the anniversary. Uh, I know. Uh, NHL. What's her name? Jen. Uh, NHL, NHL history. No, that was it was Mike Camito. Well, Mike Camito. Sorry, it was Mike yeah. Camito. Right. Yeah, he does NHL like all the he does all the this day in NHL history. So, That's right. Um, That's right. Yeah, but anyways, it was look, it happens. And Connor Hellbuck to that point had been fantastic, and you don't mm-hmm. blame him for that because again, I I would imagine that's part of the Jets' plan. If the Jets' plan was it to keep Connor Hellbuck in the net, then he would have le- wouldn't have left the net. But they obviously have a, a game plan in order for them to take possession of that puck quickly and get it to him. And again, if that puck doesn't rim the way it did, he stops it, and it's not an issue. Right. And so in, in in instead, it's two one. And now the Bruins fans are just wild because, you know, it's one thing if you score a goal, greasy goal or a hardworking goal, but to get a a fluke goal like that, that's a backbreaker because at that point, you know, you're not, you're you're thinking, are we going to be able to beat this guy? This guy's unbelievable. He's Mm -hmm. stopping everything. I mean, there was one play where Connor Hellebuck was literally on his ass, then turned around, had his back to the thing, still made the save. He's, you know, he kept making all the stops. So, I mean, the the reality was for, for the Jets and for the Bruins, I, I think he was a bit in their heads. Like, I don't think we're going to be able to beat this guy. So mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of one of those things that, that was definitely a little bit of a backbreaker because it was such a fluke and it gave the Bruins so much more life. That's exactly what it did. It gave them life when they, and gave them confidence that they were going to get some more goals when uh, they, they'd been struggling to do that at that point in time. And then uh, we talked about a bit of a controversial penalty call, Mark Shifley in the box for tripping. Uh, and, and Jake DeBrusque gets his 12th of the year assist to Pasternak and Lindholm. And it's an absolutely beautiful play by Pasternak. He's such a fantastic hockey player to watch. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's, yeah, I'd say there's maybe a dozen guys that are worth paying for to watch. 
he's one of them. The Bruins, you know, Patrice Bergeron is probably worth, you know, doing it as well, just to, for all the subtleties in his game and all the genius in his game. And we can name the other ones. You know who they are. You know mm-hmm. who the superstars in this league are. This is a beautiful play by Pasternak setting up the brusque. And you can just see they, they, they know each other so well and they've played together for so long. And they have such a high level of intelligence. The entire, you know, core of that Bruins team does has such a high level of intelligence and reliance and uh, just uh, muscle memory as for where everyone's going to be. And DeBrusque makes no mistake sort of on the read on the, on, on the deflection. Uh, and at the 15 minute mark of the second period, it's a tie game at two all Dave. Yep. And, and that's when you just really felt that momentum mm-hmm. already starting to crumble and for the, or, or the reserve, I should say for the jets starting to crumble and, and the Bruins started to build their momentum, and you could feel it chugging along. And whether you agree or disagree with a penalty, the reality is you have to kill off the opportunity. And the Jets, I mean, look, it's the number one power play for a reason, right? And and the Jets did some good things, I thought, for the most part in the power play, but they uh, ultimately fell short. And, yeah, it's a two-all game. And, and again, the problem for the Winnipeg Jets was the, the momentum continued, right? And, and they were outshot. I mean, through two the last two periods, it was it was significant. I think it was like what twenty seven to nine or something like that. So, um, but even in that second period, at one point, I think it was like eleven to two in favor of Boston. So, um, you know, you're back on your heels, and and it was not a, it was not you know you're expecting Connor Hellebuck to to be otherworldly, which he was to a certain degree. And for the record, just to clarify, I didn't think that when Connor Hellebuck had his back. To the to the net that that was a world class save. I just thought <laughs> I just thought it was just hilarious that he was just in such a zone that even when he doesn't even have his face to the uh, to the oncoming puck, he was still making the stops. But regardless, the Jets just weren't able to stop the Boston Bruins from coming at them, and that's what mm-hmm. the Boston Bruins did for the remainder of that second period and for the third period, and and they kept coming at the Jets in waves, and they controlled possession and they controlled the puck, yeah. and they. Again, if it wasn't for Connor Hellebuck, it would have been a much different game. I saw some of the Bruins um, media guys who we follow, of course, because we used to have them on the show uh, back in the day. Yeah, more regularly you know, they, at least. Yeah, more regularly. Uh, they their position was they were like, wow, like if it wasn't for Connor Hellebuck, this is probably a five or six gold game right now well, because of the way. A, you know, yeah, yeah, and we've said that a lot. I mean, look, you're giving up forty shots in a game. That's less than ideal. You know, Especially because it was well, you know, what were the shots on goal after ten minutes? I mean, after thirteen, sorry, 10, after, thir- no, thirteen, 13 10, ten for the Winnipeg. Jets. Yeah. yeah, so the Jets gave up, you know, twenty nine shots over the last uh, uh, forty minutes of the and game, and only took what ten, uh, and took fourteen over the over 14. fourteen in the last okay. forty minutes. They, yeah. It was one sided, is yeah. what we're trying to say. And you know, yeah. by any by any metric you want to look at, it was one sided over the last forty minutes of the game. Three nothing in terms of goals, shots, possession, face offs. The Boston Bruins are a damn good hockey team, folks, and the Jets were close, but it only counts uh, in as, as, as you as said, we, as in, we said earlier, horseshoes. horseshoes and hand grenades. Uh, Nick Foligno gets the game-winning goal, eleven oh eight mark of the third period. Uh, it's his sixth. Charlie Coyle and uh, and Frederick get the assist uh, on it, and it's just a blown coverage by the Jets, and they've been pretty good at not blowing coverages this year, uh, especially in the high danger zone. But this one was just a miscommunication between, yep. I believe, Connor and Dubois, and if I'm wrong, don't kill me for it. I'm on some uh, cold medicine tonight, so uh, things might have been a little bit blurry, but uh, it's a it's a, it's a miscommunication, and it's a broken coverage, and uh, you know, Nick Foligno is, knows how to score. He's done for a long, lot of years in this league, yeah. and, he, and he fires a wrist shot past Connor Hellebuck, giving the Bruins eventually the 3-2 victory as a result. Yeah, and, and like we said, that's one of those those mistakes you just can't really afford to make is the fact that you know the, you're, you leave a guy open in a, in a high danger area. And there's only so many saves that Connor Hellebuck can make. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the Wayne, it's what, 840 left to go in that third period. So it's, it's really, you know, the teams that played tight, it was actually, a, even though the Boston had had more shots, it felt like it was a pretty tight opening 10 minutes of that third. And, and you look again, you have to reference the fact that it doesn't look good when um, the refs don't make, Oh, 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 obvious calls, you know, like to, to miss the Pierre Luc Dubois high stick is, is, is pretty bad because again, if it's, if it's happening away from the play, I don't care if it happens away from the play, maybe a linesman's watching. It's not the big deal, but the reality is that you're going to tell me that four guys with the puck watching in front miss that it's, and I mean, 
again, you could think that he was, um, you know, exaggerating, try, embellishing, trying to, to, and then call him in for an embellishment. But like every single person, I mean, we're watching, the camera's watching it. Everybody is watching it for a reason because that's where the puck is, meaning that's what the refs are watching. And if the refs are watching it, you can't not call it a high sticking penalty. And again, Boston has a phenomenal penalty kill. So the Jets aren't necessarily going to score, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's just an inconsistency in the game that it's part of the reason why people want to hear from the refs. Not that the refs are going to give you an answer anyways, but like, I think the account of the lack of accountability, it bothers people because there really isn't any, there's no mechanism to discuss like, wait a second. So you made, you may, I mean, the problem is it'd be torched because every, everybody would be like, have a list of things that the refs missed. And it's easy to look. And I'm, and don't get me wrong. What a hard job. It is a hard job. The game moves extraordinarily fast. But the reason why they added a fourth official was to get things right. So don't tell me you're going to add a fourth official to get make the right calls and then have stuff that just is stu- – and again, that's just one example. I mean, how many examples? You got guys – the fourth ex- official tends to now just get in the way. And and we how many times have we seen plays get screwed up because, you know, a linesman gets hit with a puck, the puck stays in the zone. Or a ref is, is in the way and you can't clear. Like, there's – is the benefit is the, is it is it being outweighed by the negative effect you know because so far you don't really see that 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 positive at least i don't so it's it's unfortunate i'm not blaming the refs uh solely i think again like i said i think boston was the better team ultimately but um and i thought swayman played good you know good enough in the second and third period to keep his team you know ahead and so or keep it in his team in it and then of course to keep give his team retain the lead as he was able to do. And, and again, the Jets didn't have the requisite push they needed with the goaltender pulled with what I think was at a minute 42 left in that third period, Drew. So that's that's an unfortunate situation, but it is what it is. And uh, there's a reason why, like I said, the Boston Bruins are 18-0-2 at home. Yeah, they are a very impressive home team. The Jets dropping a 3-2 decision to the Bruins. No time to uh, weep, though. The Jets wrap up the pre-Christmas portion of the schedule tomorrow in Washington against the Capitals, a rematch of where the Capitals uh, went into Winnipeg a couple weeks ago and did some damage to the Winnipeg Jets. When we come back here on the Illegal Curve post-game show, we'll talk about tomorrow's game against the Capitals. We'll give away some prizes. Dave M. will do a Manuk Moose Minute after the Moose won last night in Iowa. Much more to come. Don't go actually. anywhere. Just stay, for stay where me, you Joe. are. If you can watch Chris Strebler and the New York Jets on your second screen. People make talking sure the about screen it. is locked to the Illegal Curve post-game show. We'll be right back. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, we're with you on a Thursday night. Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, John Stewart, Dennis Miller, Brad Garrett, the biggest acts and all the up-and-comers. They've all made their mark at Rumors Comedy Club, North America's longest-running independent comedy club. Rumors has kept Winnipeg laughing for over 25 years. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Make it a great night out with friends or book your office or birthday party, even a fundraising event at Rumors. Get all the details and dates on upcoming shows at RumorsComedyClub.com. He winds up. Oh, looks like Ezzy took that one right in the choppers. A blistering fast puck hurts like H-E double hockey sticks. That's why I let the pros at Linden Market Dental Center turn my yow into wow. Get your brilliant smile back with state-of-the-art restorative and cosmetic dentistry from real pros. And remember, always wear a mouth guard. Now that's solid on ice advice. Learn more at LindenMarketDentalCenter.com. Creating smiles for life. Whoa, Ezzy, everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving, the house is upside down, the kids failed miserably at packing the fine china, and my life is in chaos. Chaos! Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rollies and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit Rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage, online at Rollies.com. Dave, my man, why are you in the car already? It's hours until game time. Uh, Drew, it's because I'm stressed out right now, driving around downtown Winnipeg, looking for a parking spot, and I'm not finding one. I've lost Ginsburg. I don't even know where that guy is right now. Dave, haven't I taught you anything? Do what I do. 
pre-book your entire month's worth of game day parking with the Grid Park app. It's super easy to use and saves me both time and stress. Well, Drew, I'm not independently wealthy like you are. So I'm sorry that I don't have millions of dollars to pre-book my parking month in advance. What's that going to cost you? $25? How about five bucks? Come on, five dollars? No way. Five bucks. I'm not telling you a lie. And our listeners can get a free park with the new special promo code, Illegal Curve. Guess what? There's more. Come on. There's more, Drew. You're lying to me. What more could there be? Grid Park now has underground parking, so my car can stay warm during the game. So wait a second. Wait a second. All, All the driving around I do, looking for parking, minus 40. You're telling me I could be toasty warm in a car after the hockey game. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Underground parking. Just download the Grid Park app. That's G R Y D Park and use the code Illegal Curve. All one word. You'll park for free your first time. Hi, it's Drew from Illegal Curve here. Selling your home can be stressful, but it wasn't for me. Thanks to my friends at Zapia Group Realty, they made the process so easy. My home sold within 48 hours and with multiple offers. Zapia Group Realty took care of everything with their exquisite customer service and attention to detail. If you want to sell your home for more in less time, get started by talking to Frank and Mauro Zapia of Zapia Group Realty. Online at zapiagroup.com. For three generations and over 80 years, Tough Duck has been making apparel that works and plays as hard as the people who wear it. From jackets to work boots and everything in between, Tough Duck's clothing can handle the harshest environments, even the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Work to live, live to play. Visit toughduck.com. 9.35 in the evening. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve post-game show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manouk with you on this Thursday night. We'll be back again tomorrow night for the post-game show after the Jets and the Washington Capitals. Dave, this how did the Jets bounce back? I mean, this is a, you know, they had a 2-0 lead here. They Mm -hmm. probably thought that they were in a pretty good position, at least to earn one point. They end up getting none. Now they have to go to Washington, the second half of the back-to-back. You know, this is the, like I said, the sixth game in eight nights. How, how, how do they find sort of an extra reserve tomorrow to, to be able to, you know, compete and, and, and get a good result against a, a very improved Washington Capitals team from where they were earlier in the season? Well, the good news for the Jets, the Capitals are playing right now. We're just played today, and so there, right. and that game went to overtime. So there's a a benefit in that regard for the Winnipeg Jets is that they, they it's not just two one team that's going to be a playing a back to back. It is going to be two teams, of course, having played a back to back. But yeah, I mean, look, you you know how you did against Washington in your building, and you want to have a measure of, of revenge. You want to have a good feeling. You really do want to have. I mean, you don't want to go into the um, the, the break having lost three of four. And as mentioned that on the show the other night, it's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, if you would have lost the game on Tuesday night against the Ottawa senators, you know, and you had two real tough games. To, oh, is that you drew? Sorry. I'm yeah. getting you guys confused, but okay. We this, yeah. 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 But the point is that, you know, that, that very easily could have been a four game losing streak. Well, right now you've lost two of three and uh, you need to, you need to kind of even things out because, one of the things you know we've written about or we've talked about is the fact that the Jets have banked a lot of points, right? So they're they're in the top upper echelon right now of the Western Conference, and that's a huge thing for them. Mm-hmm. But and and we talked about it. They've had Saku Manalainen and, and Nikolai Ehlers on the trip. Now um, um, Rick Bonus was asked about that yesterday, or sorry, this morning, mm-hmm. and his update was essentially, you know, they're on the ice, they're skating, but they're still weeks away. Now. Yeah. And Dreger was on insider trading, uh, I think, after the game on Tuesday and said something like uh, Ehlers is, is two weeks away. So yeah. you, you is, can expect. Which is first week, uh, you know, which is the first week of January. So it's getting closer. Yeah, it's getting closer. But that's, I mean, look, that's massive because January is going to, like, that's why if you're the Winnipeg Jets and you can just kind of stay even Steven, mm-hmm. that's not a, that it's, it's huge. And that's kind of, kind of got to be your motivating factor. You know, you've got to continue to play a little bit. I think you have to play a little bit tighter. Mm -hmm. And they did. And you can see what happens when you make one mistake. One mental mistake ends up with, you know, a Nick Foligno goal in the back of the net. And it's a 3-2 game in a game that you very easily could have at least forced to overtime and maybe won because the Jets have been so good at three on three. 
So, Mm -hmm. you know, you, I would put the jets three on three against any team right now, obviously with, what are they seven and one in overtime? So that, that would have been a way to kind of motivate the jets to, to, to do that. But now you'd say, okay, well, how do you do it against Washington? The question becomes, do they insert some fresh legs into this lineup? You know, Dylan Sandberg, a couple of big pizzas tonight, you know, he made a couple Mm of uh, big mistakes that ended up as pretty grade a chances against, against the jets. Do the jets sit him tomorrow and put in Kyle Capo Bianco? Do the Jets want to, you know, put a, you know, Michael Essimon into the mm-hmm. lineup to gain a little bit of 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 pizzazz, a little a little tenacity? Uh, maybe they do. And, Fresh and that's, legs, does that make you well, said very important. It's, it's kind of like the idea of like when you had a taxi squad, you may as yeah. well avail yourself of the opportunity that's present with these guys being there. So to me, that it's definitely something that you have to consider because, you know, it might be useful to get get a little bit of an injection of some, some freshness into this team because they are, as we've detailed, they played a lot of hockey. I know Esteban has been played in, in what, five straight games. And so maybe you get him into a, into a, into the contest. Maybe you get, you know, someone, I don't know who you sit in, 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 in his place because you're not sending anybody from the third line. So you maybe switch the, you know, maybe you don't, but I mean, actually Anson Fialbi is going to look for, for revenge against his former club. So, um, <laughs> Maybe you don't sit him either, and you don't want to break up that all Swedish line, which uh, Kevin Stenlund was asked about uh, today. You know, if they had a name or nickname or whatever it was. But look, it is what it is. I, I just think the Jets need to to find something, and and we'll see. Obviously, whether they're gonna go with David, pa- I mean David Riddich or Connor Hellebuck in that, because it was a heavy amount of shots for Connor Hellebuck tonight, and obviously he's had a rest for a number of games. Now, what did mm-hmm. he? When was his last game? Was it a week ago? Was it well, a, his last it, game before tonight was Saturday in Vancouver. Right. So, yeah, it'll be almost yeah. a week, right? So, I mean, well, like... I mean, he, well, I mean, he played tonight, but, uh, you know... He, yeah, he but, had, I'm, well, he but big, I say... But he, he had, had four gap. days off in the yeah. middle, of, yeah, which is unusual for him. Right. So, anyways, yeah. I'm just saying that you could, you could, in theory, you know, run him out tomorrow. But, I mean, Riddich made a number of saves and, and um, you know, the Jets won his last one. So, uh, mm-hmm. Washington's going to be a tough test. And I just think that uh, I, I don't. I mean, I think both teams are going to be fairly even in terms of like their legs because of the fact. I mean, you could say the Jets might be a little bit more burnt out. I haven't obviously analyzed the capital schedule, Drew, the way we've looked at the Jets schedule, but right. ultimately, I think it's it'll be it'll be it'll be a good test to see the Jets if they can kind of you know pull out the last sort of um, you know leave it all out there, uh, the last sort of um, gasp out of the tank, and see if they can just get enough to kind of really just build something tomorrow in Washington and, and hold on for a big win. Yeah, exactly. It'll be a key game for the Jets tomorrow in the U.S. nation's capital post game right around 845 p.m. tomorrow uh, from the Jets and the Capitals. Uh, Dave and Ezzy will be there for sure. I'm a question mark depending on how my travel goes tomorrow as I'm heading down to the Southern Bureau of Illegal Curve, uh, <laughs> Mid-South, let's say, uh, rather than the Deep South. So the Mid-South of the uh, Illegal Curve Bureau down to do some shows from down there over the holiday season. Let's get some uh, comments. Contest, Dave. We have uh, the Illegal Curve Merchandise Contest. We do it yes. after each and every game. The unique code word, if you don't know how to enter, listen to me very closely. In the show description of the YouTube channel, there's a link to the contest page. Click that link. You'll see a whole bunch of things you can do to gain entries. Click one of them. One of them says unique code word. Enter the following unique code word there. You get 10 bonus entries. If you can't find it on the YouTube page, go to our website, legalcurve.com. You'll see the contest link in most any article there. Click that. Same page will open. You'll see all the different things you can do to earn entries into the illegal curve merchandise contest where we give away winnipeg jets gear after each and every uh broadcast here on the illegal curve post game show which of course is brought to you by betway dave m the unique code for the illegal curve contest tonight anybody guessed it yet five anybody... five 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 people Tur- have guessed i blame it? i blame turd because turd kind of gave everybody the clue aka actually gave everybody the word so uh, I'm. It was. It was. In fact, it was a. Tur- I went easy because sometimes it's you go with the well, obvious. The holiday choice. season. You sometimes want to. You want. You want to throw the crowd a bone. Although well, they don't get. They. They really don't get anything extra. <laughs> they just get. Oh, they do. They get. I, they get bonus points. Well, I'm saying early they don't, bonus I, points. Yes, they get early bonus points, which doesn't yes. actually translate to anything else. Uh, anything different. No, but, but but anyways, the point is that uh, you know. I mean, I went with the went went with the obvious one. Cheers. Which uh, actually, if I show you a picture on my phone, it'll be a picture of Ezzy with uh, with uh, Norm from Cheers. 
Well, it actually was, but it wasn't really Norm. It was a cutout of Norm if oh. I post that. But the problem is if I go too far, it'll be various pictures of Ezzy that probably are not appropriate to show um, because if anybody stayed in a hotel room with Ezzy, the guy is just an animal. I mean, it's just, it's, it's all over the place with that guy. So I don't recommend it to anybody. I feel bad for his fam. But regardless, <laughs> he's a big, dumb animal, folks. We love him. Anyways, the point is I went with Cheers because, you know, it's uh, that's where everybody knows my name. I actually was going to go for the record with, where everybody yeah, knows my name, yeah. but the problem was it was too long. Only oh. about max max of twenty. So, cheers! It is. Cheers! It cheers, is. The- cheers to everybody in the uh, in the chat, and cheers is the co- see, unique code word. Enter that, get ten bonus entries in the illegal curve contest. And guess, guys and girls, remember we're getting close to the grand prize winner, the NHL game of your choice next month. Yeah. So uh, we'll do that. I don't know when we'll do that, Drew. Uh, I'm trying to think of it. What's the schedule look like? Uh, well, New Year's Eve, they play in Edmonton, and then I think they have New Year's Day off, and then do they play on the second, I think, again? Uh, so we'll have uh, to... I'm looking right now at the schedule. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They play. No, they play on the third against third, Calgary. Okay. That's yeah. a home game. They play on the 31st against the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. That'll be a, that'll be a, lot, lot, a lot of hockey for me. I'll be at the Moose game at 4 o'clock. I'm going to have two tickets to give away for that Moose game for, for folks to be aware of. Good. And only one point. Should be ten points, Darwin. I hope. I hope I wrote this. I hope it's ten. Oh, it's only worth one. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. I'll. I'll. Amend, well, maybe I'll try and amend that. I right, actually, the people yeah, guessed it early. You guys just got burnt because I'm going to switch it now to make it <laughs> worth ten. <laughs> there Anyways, you go, although Emmel's. I, although I suspect if I update it, what'll end up happening is you'll you'll either you'll either be either able to re-enter or you might get screwed, which kind of is funny actually. Sorry. Although I I'll, although I, I feel bad because Bailey the intern. She also uh, put in the early one. So I, I, I don't feel bad for Frosty or Alan or Turd, but Bailey, I feel bad about. Sorry, That's Bailey. kind of you. So let's give away uh, our, some merchandise. Yes. Who's the winner of the contest? The winner of the contest is, drum roll, please, Dun-dun-dun. Todd Peters. Oh. oh, you just hit it. Todd Peters. All right. There you go. Oh, there we go. Todd Peters. Uh, so Todd uh, entered. I don't remember what Todd's winning choice was. I could find out actually, but. Todd, I, I always laugh. Well, Todd won because, yes. you know how Todd won, folks? I visited don't know. A legal, visited a legal curve. Not saying that's that that's simple. the reason why. Forward. But if you visited a legal curve, that's how Todd won. So, uh, continue. I mean, for the, I mean, I'm, for I'm the record, sorry. visited illegalcurve.com, not visited like all of us in person. As much yes. as we'd love yes. to get together with all of you, illegalcurve.com. But but more importantly, um, I think also that I, I was actually going to amend and say, actually, no, wink, wink. Todd actually won because he left a glowing review about a legal curve on our podcast. And as a result, that's how he won. It works. Whatever it is, congratulations to Todd Peters, the winner of the Illegal Curve Merchandise Contest. We'll be in touch with Todd. Uh, Apparently Todd <laughs> cannot be here, but Frosty's prepared to accept it on his behalf. Just to give a little update because people are wondering where their merch is. Yeah. I'm a little bit behind. I'm under the weather, unfortunately. So I'm uh, trying to get everything under control here at the Illegal Curve headquarters. Mm-hmm. But don't don't you worry. They may not be uh, Christmas gifts, but they might be post-Christmas, pre-New Year's. There's a week of time where Dave M will be driving around the city, maybe to places like Lockport, maybe other spots, parts unknown. I will be delivering some merch all next week. So I will, uh, I'll just get the icy wagon. If I, I'd love to get Ezzy. I don't think he'll be available, but so Spencer, if you want to wait for one more week, you might have to wait if you want to have Ezzy come with me. And then Ezzy's I can just, out of town, Dave. I, so I said, if he wants to wait one more week from next oh, week, on top of that, I come on, you. pay attention. Okay. Let's go. That's yeah. that. That, that. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Indeed. Yes. So Dave M is going to, he's working overtime. The sad, you know, Dave M's and, and his elves in the workshop are, uh, are getting that merchandise ready for everybody. So uh, hang tight. We appreciate everyone's patience as we get uh, all eyes out to our friends. Uh, Dave M, the moose yes. played last night, which means it's time for. Put on your antlers. It's time for the Manuk Moose Minute on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. <laughs> Ah, the Manitoba Moose. Yes, that team that is the AHL club of Winnipeg. They were in Iowa uh, in the path of like the blizzard of a century that's supposed to be hitting Toronto. They've got a blizzard coming in Iowa. I don't know if you saw that weather. The sport reporter who was 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 doing weather. Very funny. So he he was he was hilarious how bitter he was. That was hilarious. So I thought (laughs) anyways, the Moose, uh, they got Arvid home back, but he wasn't in the lineup for the Manitoba Moose. He was returned after the emergency recall was over, obviously with Connor Hellebuck getting healthy and Ready to go. So they had Oscar Salmonen in net 
with Evan Cormier up from Kalamazoo, backing him up. And uh, 0-0 game after 20 minutes, pretty tight. 9-8, I think, were shots in favor of the home team. And then the second period, the Moose started to get rolling. Uh, alternate captain, Cole Meyer, he's been really good since he returned from injury. He scored, I believe, his fifth goal of the season to make it one nothing, and then followed that up with a second goal to make it 2 nothing for the Manitoba Moose. His sixth goal, of course, if you can do proper math. The uh, Wild were able to strike back towards the end of that second period to make it a 2-1 game. And then the Moose started to chug. Who else? But the lunch pail line continued to contribute. Evan Poli, 58 seconds into the third period. So that made it a 3-1 lead for the Moose. And then Dominic Toninato, he scored uh, on the power play to make it 4-1. And then adding a little insurance, Jeff Mallott with his team leading 14th of the year um, to make it a 5-2 game. And then the Wild would add a goal with three minutes to go. But the Moose would hang on and win. 5-3 drew in uh, Iowa. So they are now winners of three straight games, five of their last six. And they improved to 15-7, 2-1 on the season. So uh, the Moose are feeling good about themselves. And, you know, that's it's a good thing because they've got some They've been dealing with some injuries, obviously, and, and some recalls, and they've lost Chaz Lucius and um, uh, Brad, Brad Lambert, Lambert, of course, to the to the uh, World Juniors. There's actually mm-hmm. a good article today about uh, all the Jets prospects, well, all the Canadian team's prospects who are playing in the um, in the World Juniors, and, of course, Rutger McGrory, the 2022 first-rounder, as well as Fabian Wagner, the uh, 2022 sixth-rounder. So um, for Jets prospects who are out in Eastern Canada playing in the World Juniors getting started on Boxing Day. But anyways, it was, uh, it was a good game for the Moose and they will uh, conclude their pre-Christmas portion of the schedule tomorrow night in Iowa in a rematch. So that should be a good one. That I think starts at 7 o'clock. Hold on, let me just make sure. Check that out right now. 7 o'clock. So the Jets game starts at 6. The Moose game starts at 7, which means... Because, of course, tomorrow, I mean, because we have no Saturday show. Yeah. Don't you worry, folks. I will, I maybe will, I'll, I'll convince Drew and as, oh, wait, what am I talking about? I'm hosting tomorrow. You're hosting tomorrow. I, I oh. might not be, it's questionable if I'm going to be here or not. That's amazing. I didn't even think about it. This is, of course, I'm going to be doing, doing a, I'm going to be doing a live moose thing. As he's going to be like, Dave, I got to go. I'm flying. I'm like, no, 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 just get off. We'll just do a one on one man show. The Dave Manuke experience talking about the Manitoba Moose. I'll there you go. With it. Something to look forward to for tomorrow night's post game show after the Winnipeg Jets and the Washington Capitals. Uh, we look forward to that. Uh, I want to say personally, if I'm not here tomorrow and it's again up in the air, I'm hoping to be, but uh, time will tell and travel will tell on that fa- on, on, on that factor. If I'm not, I want to wish uh, everybody in the chat, everybody watching, everybody listening, and all the best. Merry Christmas, whatever you're celebrating this time of year. Even if you're not celebrating anything specific and you're spending time with family i hope you have a great time with it and you uh you get some you know that, that, that qt and maybe you sort of take a step back from the hustle and the bustle of uh of everything that goes on in the world and you uh you just get a little bit of time with your loved ones because it's important to do that so if i'm not here tomorrow i want to extend that uh, to everybody else and dave m and as you'll say their own piece tomorrow uh without me in in that case but i just want to say that uh, love, love your loved ones a little bit more this year than than you did last year just because you know they're there and you never know when they won't be there anymore so spend some quality time with them and i hope you have uh have some good time with them wherever you may be and whatever you're doing to celebrate that's it for the illegal curve post game show on this thursday night want to say a big thank you to all the sponsors who make the post game show the saturday show on the website a possibility our friends at rumors restaurant and comedy club linden market dental center zapia group realty betway they're the title sponsor of this here post game show. Tough Duck, Boston Pizza, Seagram's, Rollies Transfer, Grid Park, and the Keg. Support these fine businesses because of their continued support of illegal curve hockey. Thanks to Frosty Winnipeg for putting it up on the screen as he usually does. Dave M is right over there. I'm your host, Drew Mandel. If you haven't already done so, smash the like button, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, tell your friends, tell your family the best place to be after each and every Winnipeg Jets game is the Illegal Curve YouTube channel, and of course, again, on Saturday mornings. For Dave Manuk, I'm your host, Drew Mandel. Until tomorrow night at around 8.45 p.m., we wish you good night and good luck, and thanks for watching the Illegal Curve postgame show. Thanks for listening to this broadcast from Illegal Curve Hockey. For more great Illegal Curve content, subscribe to the Illegal Curve YouTube channel, 
Follow at Illegal Curve on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and visit your online home for hockey in Winnipeg, IllegalCurve.com.